This section will cover topics related to data sources and how will they be integrated to Jakarta EE applications. We all know that JPA is a specification that defines object relational mapping that can manage persistent objects directly without using any SQL statements. Thus, this recipe will enumerate us all the necessary steps in building application-managed JPA data layer using only one data source. Let me reuse our product inventory application, but this time with the database backend. We will be saving all our product records inside this product table schema under the Jakarta EEDB database. By the way, I will be building the schema definitions here using MySQL version 8 for 64-bit operating system. Now, on the JPA side, all the records here will be represented by an entity class called product. A JPA entity class is a valid persistency component if it is annotated with the entity annotation. And this table annotation here can be specified if there is a need to explicitly map this entity class to the primary table concerned. Now, if the table name coincides exactly with this class name, then there is no need to use this table annotation. Since JPA requires a table to have at least one primary columns, some entity class properties must be mapped to these primary keys using ID annotation. The optional generated value can be used if there is a need to programmatically generate the primary key value. And to map ordinary table columns to properties, the column annotation is used. We can indicate explicitly the name of the column and include some of its metadata. Overall, a JPA entity class must have a no-argument constructor and must not be declared final. Also, if some of its properties are not involved in the object relational mapping, then we can apply them the transient annotation. When it comes to table constraint, JPA can also join two entity classes by using join column or join table annotations together with any of these four mapping annotations here. After our entity table mapping, we are now ready to create our data access object. Here now is the list of crude transactions needed by the application. And before its implementation class override fully each of these, it needs to extract first three important JPA component objects. And first among the list is our entity manager factory, which is responsible for creating these entity managers based from a persistence unit defined inside a persistence at XML found in the meta INM. This persistence unit is a configuration details which defines the JPA provider that will implement the whole specification. In our case, it's from the open JPA. This provider class is included in the following Maven dependencies which we need to include. Also part of this configuration are the entity classes involved in our ORM mapping. Also included are some core persistence rules needed to be enabled or disabled for our JPA entity managers. For instance, this exclude enlisted classes, which tells JPA manager to stop auto-scanning other entity classes not found in this list. And lastly, other important properties needed by our JPA which is composed of some JDBC connectivity details, like this driver class, which is in our case a MySQL driver, since I will be using MySQL 8 data source in this recipe. Thus, we need to import into our Maven dependencies the following MySQL connector. Aside from the driver class, we need the URL address of our database schema and the username password of our database server and other properties are JPA-related, needed to manage some ORM issues. After successfully configuring our Entity Manager factory, we can now create Entity Manager per crude transaction, which will give us the JPA operation for data persistency and query transactions. To commit or roll back some transactional operations, Entity Transaction can now be extracted from each entity manager. And to test this DAO implementation, which happens to be a CDI request scope bin, I need to wire this to a 
familiar servlet. Also, I will be utilizing the same views from the previous recipe. Let us now compile and deploy our project. Let us now run our application and add some product. Let us now check if all of this data are flashed to our table schema. And so our recipe is working. JPA can now support stream result, which can be used to optimize data search for a relatively huge data set. I have here an example, a trivial example, that filters all the product names for a result set. To apply bin validation to our entities, we can now assign a repeatable built-in or custom container annotation to some of its properties. If I want my product ID to be a non-negative, I can apply this positive or zero validation rule. Or if I want my user to add non-empty product names, I can assign this not blank validation rule. If there are no built-in annotations that support your validation rules, you can just create your own validation rule using custom container annotations. Creating this product price validation is quite similar to customizing a CDI qualifier with some target and retention rules. Only this time that I have added a special method called value, which allows user to automatically assign an input to this annotation. I added also an annotation interface, which can be used to apply this validation repeatably to a list of value and also a constraint annotation to map a custom validator to this annotation. This price validator is a constraint validator type which will not allow any prices lower than the set minimum price. And in my product entity class, I set the name minimum price to 5,000. To capture all constraint violations, we just need to inject the validator bin object to our DAO implementation class and then manage all these violation details. In my case, when a violation is encountered, all persistent operations will halt and roll back and will log all these invalid values to the console. And before we compile this project, this whole bin validation specification will only work if we have this hibernate validator dependencies in our Maven. Let us now run our application. If I input a negative product ID, let's say minus 15, an empty product name, and a product price lower than 5,000, there you go. No data will be entered to our table because our validator bin object tells us here that those values are invalid. 